Okay, well, hello and welcome everyone. I'm Rob Kievel, and this is my colleague, Voko Drishwan. And today we'll be talking about the intricacies of data skew within Apache Spark, particularly the performance and stability effects that data skew brings. We'll be introducing a technique we created called the iterative broadcast, which allows you to join skewed data at scale within Spark. So firstly, a few words about myself. Uh, I studied my undergraduate at the University of Oxford in philosophy, politics, and economics, which naturally leads into a career in big data architecture. I've had 10 years' experience working within this, working on client site, advising my clients on uh, designing big data architectures in batch and streaming landscapes, and I'm currently working with Noit services out in the Netherlands. I typically work in the financial and counter-fraud domains, and beyond that, I'm also an avid Scala programmer and really like to actually work to develop the applications that I'm designing. <coughs> yeah. Thank you, Rob. Uh, a few words about myself. My name is uh, Foko Driesprong. I uh, studied uh, software engineering and distributed systems at uh, the University of Groningen. Uh, then I became a data engineer at GoData Driven. We're an Amsterdam-based uh, consultancy company, which uh, help uh, companies with their data engineering the data science and their digital strategy. Uh, we are also the organizer of the, the Spark meetup in Amsterdam, so if you're in Amsterdam and you want to join a, a meetup, uh, it could be at our place. I'm also uh, a committer at uh, Apache Airflow. Apache Airflow is a, is a, um, it's a monitoring uh, tool and an orchestration tool for workflows, so it works really well with, uh, with, uh, with Spark, so if you want to uh, yeah, design uh, ETL pipelines, you uh, should have a look at uh, Airflow. And uh, beside that, I'm a real open source enthusiast. I contribute to a lot of projects, and I'm also really happy to see like uh, this big crowd here. And uh, that's about me. Back to you, uh, Rob. Thank you. Okay, so what we'll be covering today. Uh, so first, we'll be discussing a particularly challenging data skew problem that Fokker and I both encountered while uh, working as a contractor at ING Bank. We'll be talking about the theory of the join strategies available out of the box in Apache Spark and why these are so heavily affected by the nation of data skew. Then I'll hand back to Foco for introducing our solution to the problem, the iterative broadcast. We've done an in-depth benchmark of this technique and we'll be showing you our, the performance numbers of the technique. And then we'll talk through the considerations that you guys will need to keep in mind if you wish to use this technique in your projects. Then finally, we'll go over the future work that we wish to do with the iterative broadcast. So, ING, naturally as a large international bank, is enacting billions and billions of transactions uh, every, every single year. Everything from individual customers doing their groceries through to the bulk transactions enacted by companies between each other, all the way to the extreme of the high volume automated transactions that flow within and between financial institutions. ING is therefore interacting with billions of accounts around the globe. And these, as well as being owned by consumers, are owned by millions of companies which are typically arranged in complex hierarchies of parent and subsidiary companies. And as part of this, we want to really see the picture at the financial entity level. We want to roll these hierarchies up into a single view of a company. The key challenge here is that these transactions are by no means evenly distributed. So while a typical customer may only do a few hundred transactions a month at most, something like a tax authority within a country is hopefully interacting with every company within that country. At the extreme, we have systems such as Ideal in the Netherlands, which actually represents one in six of all transactions made. So where, if we were to view these transactions and account relationships in a network diagram, such as this on the left, we wouldn't so much see this pattern of evenly distributed transactions. We'd see something more akin to this, with these sort of white hot hubs of transactions flowing in the center of the diagram towards these commonly used accounts. What effect does this landscape have on Apache Spark? Well, I imagine many of you in this room are familiar with this screen. So you look into your jobs, you see the tasks, the progress bar initially goes quite quickly, but as we get towards the end of the screen, it begins to slow down 
and may ultimately get stuck at the, at the final few tasks. The, the Windows progress bar of Apache Spark, as some call it. If you drill into this task, you'll see uh, the table at the bottom, which shows you the runtime durations of these tasks arranged into percentiles. And if you're experiencing data skew, you'll typically see this picture with the final percentile taking multiple times longer than other percentiles and also operating on many more rows and uh, higher data volumes. And this typically hits joins the hardest you'll see in your work. To understand why this happens, let's go over the join types available in Spark. But we'll be focusing really today on the top two, the sort merge join and the broadcast hash join. The others are more specific scenarios, such as many-to-many -many joins or joins on particularly small tables. So let's go into the sort merge join. We have an example here with a smaller unique table on the left and a larger non-unique table on the right. So this is a one-to-many join. And this is a good proxy to our matching accounts to transactions scenario I described earlier. So if we wish to join these two tables in Apache Spark, the first thing we need to do is to divide the data up into partitions. And we do this in Spark via hashing on our join key or keys to produce a, a de deterministic uh, partition number that we should send the data to. So this looks something like this, where you can see we've now split our two tables into two partitions each, four partitions, with keys one to three on our left and two to four on our right. And also as part of this, we've locally sorted each partition. Our executors can then pick up those partitions and they do this based on uh, having common keys. So again, keys one and three have ended up in the same partition for the two data sets. And then enacting the merge is the relatively simple prospect of running sequentially through our two partitions and bringing the data in where the keys match. So finally, we have our single output table split into two partitions and these are nicely evenly distributed and everything's worked, worked well. In terms of cost function, this is log linear, so it's relatively efficient process. If you look into the SQL tab of the Spark GUI, you can see what join strategy Apache Spark has chosen. This is done on a number of factors, most significantly in Spark 2.2. This uses the cost base optimizer, which uses statistics of the incoming data to choose the most optimal plan. This can be overwritten explicitly in your code or with join hints. And you can see here that uh, this has chosen a sort merge join, and we can see the stages I just discussed. The exchange at the top, scanning through those partitions and hashing them. The local sort, the merge, and projecting to the output tables. So how does data skew affect this scenario? So if we run through the same example, but now we change our larger table, so we've made key four dominant, and we'll do the same process. We will determine our partitions by hashing the keys. Immediately, we can see that the situation has become quite unbalanced. That fourth partition is much larger than the other three. The sort of that partition, the local sort, will also naturally take longer. So when we load that partition onto an executor, the load itself will also be slow for executor two. And the merge itself, as you can see, has a lot more work to do. This means that Executor 2 is going to be one of those trailing tasks in your Spark UI. It's going to take multiple times longer than Executor 1 in this scenario. And your expensive cluster is now pretty much sitting idle, waiting for one of your machines to complete. Your, your parallelism, which is the bread and butter of Apache Spark, has, has kind of disappeared. Also, interestingly, on, as the partitions are remaining in the, on our executors, we can see that these themselves are now skewed. So even linear operations reading from these tables is also going to be a skew scenario where you'll have certain tasks taking longer than others. When we ran this first in ING, joining transactions to accounts, 
we actually ended up with one sixth of all our data sitting in a single partition. Naturally, that uh, should take forever, but actually it uh, gave us the, the more nasty effect, which is the second problem, the stability effects of data skew. So a single key for a single account was larger than the total amount of memory that we could assign this executor. So we actually had the jobs dying with out of memory errors, garbage collection exceptions, or potentially yarn stepping in and killing the uh, container for exceeding its configured memory limits. <coughs> So what can we do out of the box in Apache Spark to help this situation? Firstly, and most simply, can we just throw more memory at the problem? This will, in the case of the stability issue, it will solve the issue. It, at some level, we'll be able to give it enough memory to, that we can hold this key in memory and we'll no longer have, have out of memory exceptions. It will also make these slow partitions go much more quickly but it doesn't really get to the, the crux of the problem, which it doesn't solve the lack of parallelism that we're seeing because we still have these large tasks that are going to take relatively more time than others. So maybe more intelligently, can we re repartition the data? The whole problem arises from the way we're distributing these keys. Can we do something more intelligent with that? Again, I don't really think we can in this sense because in the ING example, we could have taken the accounts table multiplied that up by year and joined to the transactions based on the year of the transaction. This is, however, likely to be problematic because we're taking two already massive data sets and multiplying them up just to get around a technical issue. We're also confusing our code. We're mixing technical workarounds into our data logic, and that's going to lead to code maintainability issues in future, as well as code clarity problems. So I think there's hopefully smarter things we can do here. But for that, I'll hand over to Foko. Thank you, Rob. So if you're Googling on this problem and you end up uh, on Stack Overflow, then uh, they will say uh, you have to use the broadcast join. Well, that is a solution, of course. Uh, what the broadcast join does, it leaves the large table, the big one, untouched. It doesn't shuffle anything. Um, and it will copy the small table to all the executors. So the small table, that it's just on all executors, and you can just do a linear scan through all the, through the big partitions. And then you can join on the, on the, on the keys. Um, this, is an op uh, this is one of the solutions, of course. So to illustrate it a bit, if you have this, uh, these two tables, a small table and a large table, we broadcast a smaller uh, table to all, all the executors. This looks uh, something like this. Um, and then... We, these large tables also, of course, split in evenly partitions. And then, uh, yeah, we do the, the merge step. So then yeah, we scan through the, the bottom two tables, the bottom partitions, and we uh, join the key to it. Which, of course, works quite well. And as you, as you can see, if your input partitions are equally sized, then also your output partitions will be roughly the same, or will be exactly the same size, because yeah, you don't do any shuffling. You only broadcast a small uh, partition. But then, what happens if your small table isn't that small? So one of the requirements is that uh, this, uh, this table has to fit into the memory of both the executor and also in the, into the memory of the driver. And of course, you can, um, you can scale it up, but still to a certain extent. And you don't, also don't want to uh, make your executors too heavy, because if you have like really uh, big executors, then you also run into troubles uh, with the resource allocations, like you cannot fit nice, a nice number of, uh, of executors onto your yarn cluster, because you have like a huge, uh, uh, huge executors. So we encountered this problem, because at ING we tried to broadcast like the whole uh, company uh, directory of, uh, of ING, and that, yeah, it's quite, uh, quite big. So we took a pragmatic approach, and yeah, that's what we want to tell about today. So we came up with the iterative broadcast. What it actually does, it divides the, the smaller table into passes. It broadcasts a part and let all the, one of the passes and left joins it onto the uh, large table by just iterating over the table. It clears the, the partition again from the, from the memory to relieve memory pressure. And then yeah, it does the same step again um, until it converges, so until we have did all the passes. 
So let's illustrate that. So if we take like this small table, then we add an, ex add an extra column called pass. This pass is determined by sampling a uniform uh, distribution and multiplying it by the number of passes that you want to have. Uh, in this case, we, yeah, the passes are roughly the same. Um, and what we then do is broadcast the first part to all the executors, do the merge step. This is done by using a, a coalesce operation. Clear the memory again, so we throw away the, the, the broadcast from the memory, and we broadcast the second pass. And then we do uh, the same operation. As you can see here, we end up like with equally sized uh, partitions, and we still don't have any shuffling on the, on the big table, which, which is uh, something yeah, that you don't want, because yeah, if your uh, key uh, distribution is skewed, then uh, you will end up with one machine which is doing all the work, like Rob, is, uh, Rob just said. And what you end up is, exact, is essentially just uh, one thread which is doing all the, all, the, all the work, and the whole parallelism of your whole cluster is gone. So we did a performance analysis. We did this on uh, Amazon using uh, EMR, some uh, M4 uh, uh, nodes. We used uh, Spark 2.1, and if you want to get into the de details of it, uh, the benchmark is on GitHub. So um, yeah, what we were doing, we created uh, two synthetic dataset generators, one that generates like a really skewed uh, dataset, and one that generates like a uniform dataset. Uh, the skewed one is something where, the, where we expect the iterative broadcast join to excel. And the uniform one, because you have like a, a really nicely distributed key space, is one where the sort merge join would excel. Yeah, the skewed join, we, uh, gener the skewed join data set we generate by, uh, by thinking of a key. You can just configure it into the, in the benchmark application, because if you want to run it locally, you want to have some smaller key, because your MacBook doesn't have that much memory. But if you run it on, uh, on uh, EMR, then you can uh, just uh, scale up this, uh, this part. And uh, yeah, it, it's quite skewed. So when you set it to one, like 100,000 uh, uh, keys, then there will be 100,000 keys in total that, will be, that you can, will join on. And the, the, smart, the large one will be 100,000, second one 500,000, uh, 25,000, et cetera. You get it. So, and you will get a lot of, uh, of keys with just one single value. Uh, we boost this by, uh, by multiplying this uh, distribution uh, a couple of times, so we get a bit more volume in terms of rows. So let me explain this, uh, this graph a bit. On the, on the y-axis, there's the, the execution time in seconds, and this lower is better, so you, you want to have uh, as low as possible. And the number of rows, that is in the total data set. <coughs> and as you can see, it's something that yeah, uh, you might also, also expect, and if you think about it, it's quite logical. Um, the runtime of the sort merge join is um, it's, uh, relative to the uh, number of uh, keys in the large partition. So yeah, that's what we end up with, like uh, 199 partitions are processed really fast, and the single one yeah, is just um, proportional to the number of rows. That will take a lot of time. And this is uh, where we see where the iterative broadcast join uh, yeah, really excels. Um, sometimes it's, yeah, it's it's quite, some, uh, quite a bit faster, and it's also a bit more, uh, more predictable because in this case we yeah, generated a, a really nice uh, synthetic data set, but in real life this skew can be even worse as we've seen with, uh, with ING. And then yeah, it's also really hard to predict how long your jobs will run. It's also one of the things that we see is like uh, the number of passes. If you're the smaller table of the two is, uh, is uh, still quite, uh, quite big, then you have to add more passes to uh, process all the data. But it, yeah, you have to find some optimum in here. If you look to uh, the uniform uh, data set that we also generated, this is one where the key size is exactly the, of roughly the same because we also sample it from a uniform uh, distribution. Yeah, we see there that the sort merge join yeah, just excels. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just like an ideal situation for the sort merge join, so that's something that we also would expect. So one of the considerations that this iterative broadcast join does bring with it is uh, tuning hyperparameters. So first you have to decide how big is my executor, how much memory is in there, and how big can I make this uh, the broadcast uh, table. So then you can yeah, 
uh, determine the yeah, logical size of this uh, broadcast pass. And then uh, as you get more data, you have to increment like this number of passes to yeah, process all the data. And one of the things that is in there, like uh, right now we build it on top of Spark, so it's not integrated. Uh, so you will mix up some of your, for example, ETL logic with some of that iterative broadcast extra complexity. Yeah, and it's something that's not really nice, but yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in uh, the planning to make some uh, nice wrapper around it. But uh, it has to be yet to be done. So uh, some future work. Uh, right now what we do, we broadcast a variable. We do the iteration over the big table. And then we um, write it again back to HDFS. Uh, this sounds really illogical because uh, Spark is like an in-memory processing engine. And it's also something that yeah, we rather would not do. Uh, but it has to be done because we have to trigger an action to do this pass and then st start on the next uh, iteration that has to be start from a clean stage again. Otherwise, what Spark will do, as you can see in the, in the right, because it's evaluated lazily uh, before the stage starts, it will asynchronously pull in all the broadcast tables automatically. Yeah, and then you still have like the full table in memory and then yeah, uh, everything will still blow up of course. Uh, also that we uh, are planning to is to bit, make it a bit more native to Spark. Uh, right now it's uh, like I said it's on top of it. Uh, for example if you, um, if you implement this you have to do all the optimization by yourself and this is something that also the catalyst optimizer uh, could really play a part in it. Uh, and also stuff like uh, Predicate push down, there's still some stuff that can be implemented in there to create some performance gain. So to have a small recap, Spark uh, by default is not really built for processing uh, skewed data uh, using the sort merge join. And if your uh, table is not small enough to broadcast to all the executors, yeah, then you um, yeah, have a bit of a problem because there's no real join strategy to do this. Um, there are also some other efforts on the on the internet that are there, but for example, they are only available for the RDD uh, API. But uh, this is something that you can implement. We did implement it on data frames. You can implement it on data sets, but we can also at the IG we implement it into uh, into the SQL API. So that's something that you uh, can decide on yourself. Um, yeah. What the nice thing is that the iterative broadcast join uh, because your um, yeah, your workload is just nice, easily distributed. It uh, will really speed up like, uh, like the, the processing time if you have a lot of uh, skewed uh, data. So that's all. Um, on the GitHub, there is the, the benchmark. It's also the example code. So if you want like, to implement this in your own project, uh, I would suggest uh, taking a look uh, into the GitHub. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, contact uh, either one of us. Thank you. Right. Uh, we kind of hit the same problem uh, from our one of our customer. So uh, the first question I would ask is that uh, your benchmark test is based on data frame API or RDDA API. It's based on the data frame API. Right. Okay, so it'd be because uh, we our customer at the moment stick with low level uh, RDD API. They got the reason for for, for that, and uh, so which means there is no explicit or uh, ready to use join out of join in, in or in the join function that available. So we have to implement that, which introduce some uh, reduce uh, operation there that mean many extra costs. But that basically works. Um, <clears throat> so my second question is, uh, so based on your benchmark, you show the correlation between the number of rows and the execution time. Yep. Have you uh, did some test, uh, have you done some test on the scaling? I mean, if, you, if we increase the number of executors, are we expected to see near linear uh, scaling at all? Thanks. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, um, this number of partitions that you have to determine, it's also always nice to make it a multiple of uh, the number of executors that you have. For example, we see like 
the, the deviation in the running time of the partitions is really small. It's like uh, I think it uh, it runs like uh, it depends on how big it is, but it's 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 like within a few percent. So. Um, so if, if you look, if you go to the screen to the to the to the uh, processing time of a, of a task, then you see like a, a few, this percentiles that uh, the drops out. There's a really small uh, small uh, de deviation in there. So I would expect if you had had more executors that it would speed up, like linearly. And there's also um, uh, because uh, the the way the broadcast um, a variable gets distributed among uh, the, the executors quite efficient. It uses this, uh, this bitter end like peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, protocol. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Any further questions? Yes, your your benchmark showed, obviously you said you had a decided number of passes. Um, the, the chart you showed passes of, of size two and three. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, what happens if that's like 500? Like have you guys tested, like if your data sets like so we've run into this problem. Like data yeah. skew is obviously a problem. Yeah. Um, have you tested with higher numbers of passes, and, and what happens when you do that? At ING, we use uh, three passes. Okay. So yeah, I can expect like that you would like for the incremented number, but 500 sounds a lot to me, and I'm, okay. I think you run into different problems then. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, the example you said uh, your executors had like 18 gigs of RAM or something like that, yeah. um, and at three passes, that means like. Uh, you would have three times that, or like let's say 45 gigs for the total data set. Is that about right? Or, uh, uh, yeah, I think the large table is, is far bigger. I mean, I'm talking about the small table because yeah. you could you could do this with three passes, which means the small table could fit in. Uh, yeah, that memory. Um, the, the small table is equally sized, so it's not like we do two passes, then we do three passes, but it's not like that we um, uh, that we added more data to it. It's just like yeah, you see like an a additional. Uh, a constant and being added to the to the graph. Let me go. Uh, so I, I would expect like that um, that the run through time of the of the iterative broadcast join is mostly determined by the number of passes. So you want to size this this broadcast uh, table of the broadcast variables quite big, if possible, uh, not too big, of course, because then you run into different problems. Right. Um, and then second question. Um, you, you said you obviously have to persist this out to HDFS to actually like materialize it, otherwise yeah. Spark will broadcast everything. Um, what, like, what is the downside to that, like performance-wise or, or like runtime-wise? Was that okay for the problem, like that? Yeah, it's it's just expensive, and because it's yeah, it's, you have to write away all the data, and that's just quite expensive. But in your experiments, it was worth doing that. To, to yeah, there's no started. other possibility because you can say, okay, I will cache it and then do a count on it or something like that, that you trigger an action on it so it will materialize in memory, but then the count is also quite expensive. So, yeah, there's, I think you really have to dive into the, under the hood here to fix this. Okay. And maybe have some, uh, yeah, some, some state barrier that you can uh, put in there. Cool. Thank you. These benchmark numbers include that effect. So, actually, when we manage to achieve the in memory iterative broadcast join, this hopefully will be even faster, or at least the cost vector passes will. Um, I have a question. So you you already need to do, run several passes on top of the big data. Didn't you consider uh, like computing some sort of statistic to get like the biggest offenders and then salting the keys for those guys and also salting them in the small table so you can artificially introduce uh, like less skew? Yeah. Yeah, that's also one of the yeah of the approaches that you can do. Of course, you can first uh, determine the biggest keys by uh, doing an efficient research, reduce uh, kind like operation. Um, yeah, it's a different approach. I think this one is quite pragmatic. Also, I'm not saying that that approach is uh, not is 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 worse or something. That's actually the the, the kind of approach that's available already in the in the skew join. Yeah, it's just a matter of uh, attacking the problem. It would be nice to see some comparison. We didn't do that. Cool. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. yeah? Cool. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, thanks, gentlemen, for your talk, and the Thank next you. talk will begin in 10 minutes.